while back, I preached a series on ministering to the elderly, and I've been wanting to do this for a while, and I've probably uh, brought some thoughts out here and there, but I wanted to preach about ministering to young people or ministering to children, all right, and obviously that's a that's an important people group, amen? The Bible says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and, peru- and reproof give wisdom, but, here's the part I want you to notice, a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And think about that for a minute. A child left to himself. Can you imagine what would happen if a child was just left to himself? No training whatsoever, just left to himself. And interestingly, uh, as probably many of you know this, there are documented cases of children going all the way up into teen, teenhood where uh, they are actually left to themselves. Even in some cases documented to be supposedly raised by animals to some degree. You've probably heard these types of stories. Uh, or somebody was just neglected at their house. Maybe their, their parents were drunks or something and they just didn't even care. They didn't even maybe consciously know what was going on with the kids and the kids were left to just be, you know, just scavenged around like dogs with the, with the dogs and to, uh, uh, you know, whatever the case, pig pens or something like that. And left to themselves, they actually uh, did these studies. A lot of these cases were like in India, places like that, but many of them were here uh, in the USA, you know, many years back. Here's the sick thing about it. There were even psychiatrists who, in the name of science, back then when they didn't have some laws uh, protecting children's rights as much as they do now. Uh, they would actually volunteer their children to be used as these studies where they would just go for long periods of time with no uh, real training. One, kid, one guy had his child. Basically, I mean, they made sure he was fed and all that stuff, but basically was being raised with his pet monkey. And to see what would happen, would that monkey pick up the child's behaviors? And it did a little bit, but then also the child picked up the monkey's behaviors a little bit. And and this guy just watched and documented this and used that. And it's just sick what people have done, but psychiatrists are so interested in this. What will happen if a child's left to himself? Well, I'll tell you what will happen if a child's left to himself. It'll bring his mother to shame. (laughs) If a child's left to themselves, they have no, they are literally animals. But guess what? The guys that are doing these studies... They believe in evolution, and they believe we're nothing different than animals. And so why would we expect anything different? And so they're looking at this, and in the name of so-called science, they want to see what it would be like if a child was left to himself. And I watched this documentary, or a little part of a documentary that was talking about some of these things, and I watched this girl who had literally, she was neglected by her dad, her mom and dad, or I don't know, maybe she was just with her dad at the time, I can't remember, but he was a total drunk and just ignored her. And she ended up living with the dogs, basically, on her own. To the point where she literally walked around on her hands and knees like a dog, barked, you know, lapped up water with her tongue and everything. Look, I don't know if this was sensationalized or not, but here's what I know. It brought me to tears because I thought, who would do such a thing to their kid? Who would just totally neglect their kid and just let them just go to the dogs, like literally? And I watched that, and it brought me to tears, and I thought, this is why Jesus said, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believeth in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned into the depths of the sea. It's like like God was just seeing these precious kids, you know, childlike faith, just trusting in him and all that. And he was saying, anybody that would abuse these children or treat them this way, you know, man, they're, they're just like, they just don't even, they're not even worthy of being alive. It'd be better if they just had a millstone hung about their neck and cast into the depths of the sea. What That shows Jesus' compassion. And of course, you know, the time he sat a child on his knee, right? And, began, and, and the disciples were even going to, you know, we don't have time for children. They ought to be seen and not heard, right? We need to get these children out of here. And Jesus rebukes them, right? Suffer not the children to come unto me. And so Jesus had a soft spot in his heart for children. And I think it's naturally, being that children are the most frail in our society, we all ought to have a heart for children, right? Amen. This is why abortion is so wicked. This is why you see the uh, people murdering babies that have no choice. And you think, man, that's the most, you know, they, they are totally dependent on us. And just to just cast them off and say, well, it's my body, right? That's just so, so wicked. 
So <clears throat> Jesus uh, obviously uh, had a, a, a place in his heart for these young people, and, and we know that we, we are. But here's what I want to ask a few questions tonight. Number one, who is ultimately responsible for the actions of a child? Who's ultimately responsible for that? And I want to say, well, the parents, right? The parents are responsible for the actions of the child. And to some degree, I would say that that's true. You know, that's, we have that responsibility. We brought this child in, into the world, and it's our responsibility to take care of them. But then that brings up some other questions. You know, will God overlook the actions of a child based on the behavior of their parents? If the parents neglected the child, you know, is God just going to overlook their faults and the bad things that they do? If God, uh, 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 here's a question. What if the parents had a bad upbringing? What if the parents were neglected, you know? All right, let me put it this way. Let's say, uh, and we all are in agreement here what should happen to this type of a man, but let's say a man molests a child, right? And his excuse is, well, I was molested as a child. Does that ultimately mean then that, you know, oh, he's excused because of his past? No. At some point, we all, right, are responsible for our own actions. But obviously, we can tell just by observing nature. I mean, just observing what's going on in our culture. Just observe what's going on uh, with different people. Here are some statistics. You just go to just a website, not a Christian website or anything like that. I know that statistics can be skewed, and I don't ever know what to trust on statistics. But let me just give you these statistics. I think they make total sense, and you could probably see where I'm going with this. But here's just an example of a study that was done. And these are, you know, on a case-to-case basis, uh, uh, these are the percentages of cases that dealt with where, where the child didn't have a father around, okay? Just the father. Now, they had a mother, right? But they just didn't have a father around. And here are the statistics. Number one, in the case of suicide, they say that 63% of the cases were a situation where that child didn't have, that, that person didn't, wasn't raised with the father. 63% of the suicides, supposedly. Again, I don't know if these numbers are true, but they certainly, uh, I understand where, where this would be the case. Runaways, 90% of all homeless children and runaways, you know, maybe had something to do with the fact that they didn't have a father around. Behavioral disorders, 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders. Now, look, what is the world called behavioral (laughs) disorder? You know what I'm saying? That must be pretty bad. That must be a pretty bad situation for for the world to call it a behavioral disorder. Probably something that they prescribe drugs for, right? Right. And if they look at that, they would say, well, that person didn't have, that kid didn't have a father around. High school dropouts, 71% of those kids that don't have fathers, you know, I mean, of those kids that drop out uh, didn't have fathers. Juvenile detention, you know, those who would be locked up as a kid, locked up into like a, a, a jail, a juvenile detention center, 70% didn't have fathers. Those who suffer substance abuse, you know, drugs, alcohol, whatever, at very young age. I've seen kids, you know, just, I mean, like 12-year-old kids. You know, I have witnessed with my own eyes a 12-year-old kid, you know, begging people for cigarettes or whatever they can do. And they got like, I think it's crack, you know, when they have their teeth all corroded right there or maybe meth or something like that. And this kid, maybe about 12 years old, and he's like that. And he just grew up in the streets, grew up in this situation, homeless, and just living with these people. 75% of those cases ad, uh, 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 where the adolescent patients were, had substance abuse didn't have a father. And then those who just show out aggression, I mean, that could, that, I don't know where they get, you know, I don't know what that looks like exactly, what they're talking about. But these who have major aggression, anger management problems, they say 75% of them had that. Or, or uh, 75%, here's the one, 75% of the people that become rapists, if you study their background and look at their history, they didn't have a father around. Now, this doesn't even account for cases where both parents are, are, are around, but they're just bad parents, right? Obviously, there's a lot of those. Just bad parents, not knowing how to raise their kid. The kids grow up and they're bad. We're talking about just cases where the father's not around, 
All right. And, and let alone, what about the ones that grow up in foster care? Neither mother or father around. All right. That's going to be based maybe on the, the foster home that they're put, taken in. But I can tell you this by experience. Sometimes they take kids out of a home that they think is a bad home, put them into the foster care, and in the foster care they're abused. Yeah. You know? Or they don't have uh, you know any any kind of a uh, of a hope in that situation. Children today, we always say children are our future, right? And and I always think about in the present, and I think children are our future. But then then you go back and you say, well, how many of the people that are shooting up schools, you know, and doing all this stealing and doing all this kind of uh, 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 bad stuff that we see on the news all the time? How many of them had fathers around? You know, how many of them had any kind of uh, good training? and stuff like that. So the conclusion seems to be pretty simple. Basically, just having two parents in your life that have some kind of a, some kind of a commitment right, to, to just keeping you out of trouble. They don't have to even be Christians. They don't have to be just two parents in your life that are there for you and care about you and want you to, uh, to, to go somewhere. That's going to make a huge difference in a child. So I want to ask these two, the, I want to have these two points. Uh, this is the whole sermon right here. These two points. What is, uh, I'm sorry, what is, that, what is it that a child needs to learn? And whose responsibility is it to teach them that? What is it a child needs to learn? And whose responsibility is it? And to, to get to these points, I want to look back at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. The first story where children are mentioned, of course, this is the first story. Uh, first children that even existed, All right? And we can learn some things, I believe, from this passage and then comparing other scriptures, of course. Number one, what a child needs to learn. What a child needs to learn. First of all, look at verse 2. And she bare again, uh, uh, she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. Right away, here's one point that I see, is a child needs to learn what they're going to do with their life. Right? Now, I'm not getting super spiritual on this. I'm just saying, raising a child, teaching a child, training them to do something, they're going to have to know, what am I going to contribute to society? What am I going to do for my family? What am I going to do with my life? Well, look, a child left to himself, right? What are they going to do with their life? Whatever they want to do, whatever, <laughs> you know, a child that has no discipline, no instruction, no training, a child without a father, a child without any kind of, uh, uh, of correction, they're just going to do whatever they want. And guess what's going to happen? Guess what they're going to do for our society? Look around society today, right? right? Look around at what's going on with children that have no instruction, because guess what? A lot of people out there were raised in homes where they had no destruction. And so they don't even know what they're going to do with my life. Hey, somebody tell me. Hey, somebody give me some money. I'd rather just sit home and not do anything with my life. And so they have no training. Nobody's pushed them to do that. Somehow it was determined that Cain was going to be a tiller of the ground. Now, I don't know for sure if God designated that job, if God told him to do that. But somebody said, hey, you're going to get out there and you're going to work in the ground. I don't know how old Cain was in this story. We don't really have a way of knowing that. But at that time, his job was working in the ground. Apparently, as we continue to read the story, he knew how to grow fruit, vegetables, all that kind of stuff, work with his hands, get dirty, and he could bear stuff from the ground. He knew how to make stuff grow. That was his job. That's, this is what you're going to do. Abel... Here's what you're going to do. You are going to raise the sheep. You're going to take care of them. We need the sheep, at clothing, or whatever. Some people just disagree whether or not they ate meat at that point before the flood. But whatever the case, they needed the sheep around, and they said, uh, 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 you are going to take care of the sheep. Somebody had to decide what their jobs were going to be. And a child that has no direction in their life, nobody's pointed them in the right direction. What's the Bible say about children in the hands of uh, children are like arrows in the hands of a mighty man, right? Blessed is he that his quiver is full, right. right? And our job is to take our children and to point them in the right direction and shoot them, shoot them off into that direction, right? Well, a child that doesn't have any direction, guess where he's going? He's going nowhere. <laughs> he's not going to do anything. So a child doesn't have any direction. Look, here's what he's going to do. He's going to sit around all day and dream about being the next professional NBA player. <laughs> he's going to dream. He's going to dream all day about how he can make money 
being a professional video gamer. And unfortunately, there are some guys that do it, and so therefore everybody thinks that they can do it. <laughs> a millionaire, right, playing video games all day long. And they're out there, right? But I bet you they had some instruction. They know how to, you know, they knew how to take that to the next level and actually make money off it, whatever. Look, I, I don't know. I'm just saying that a child left to himself... He doesn't know what to do with his life. He doesn't know what he's going to do. And so he's not going to be any help on society. Somebody has got to tell. Now, there are self-motivators out there. Those are usually the guys that rise to the top, right? There are people that, for some reason, you, you just don't even really have to tell them what to do. They just go out and they do it. But then there's other people, you know, somebody has to get out there and say, look, I know you don't want to do this, but you're going to do this. And they have to make them do it, right? So the first thing is that a child needs uh, to know uh, what they're going to do with their life. Also this, look at verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, the second thing I want to see here is this. A child needs to learn respect for the Lord and the things of the Lord. Yeah. They need to know. How did Cain and Abel know? I, I, I don't know this for sure. I'm just assuming. I'm putting two and two together saying, his parents must have said, you know, here's what God wants for us to do. At the appointed time, however long that was, maybe every, maybe every Saturday or maybe every year, I don't know, at the appointed time, we are going to take our offerings before the Lord. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I'm reading into the story thinking they may, maybe knew that they were supposed to take a lamb. Because God didn't have respect for Cain's offering. And then, and then he says to Cain, he says, look, if you do well, you'll be accepted. Right? And if he didn't know before, then he certainly knew now. So all he had to do is do well. <laughs> right? But somebody has to know, hey, these are the things that God approves of. These are what, the things that God wants you to do in your life. You know, you don't, we don't raise our kids like this. What, do you want to go to church today? <laughs> what, do you want to read your Bible? I'm not going to force you to read the Bible, you know what I mean? We, we don't do that. The kid needs to know. They need direction. They need somebody to tell them, this is what you need. You know, this is the way that you're going to act and you're going to behave yourself at church. This is going to way you act and behave yourself whenever we're doing something for the Lord. I mean, this is how you pray. This is how you read your Bible. This, you say, well, they're going to have to learn that on their own one day. That's true. That's true. I believe that every, no matter if you're raised from the time that you're born, you're raised in church. All my kids pretty much, I mean, before, I mean, you know, just immediately after they're born, they're in church. Okay? Not, I mean, not immediately, immediately, but you know what I'm saying. Like right away, they don't like to stay home for a year and then, you know, they're in church. Okay? And so that means that their faith from the time that they're born is simply because of the fact that we made them go to church. So I believe everybody at some point in their life, that faith has to become their own faith. Right? You can't just get into heaven on mommy and daddy's faith. They have to know why they believe, what they believe. But, I mean, that's going to be a whole lot easier if they had mom and dad from the very beginning showing them the Bible, showing them the truths of God, explaining how things work, explaining right and wrong, so that they can begin to make their own opinions and then say, huh, I want to search this thing out. I want to know what the truth is. You know, and so uh, somebody has got to teach them. Somehow uh, they knew what, what their jobs were. I think probably their parents taught them or maybe, you know, God had showed them at that time. I don't know exactly how it happened. But they need to learn how to respect the Lord. Number three, look at uh, verse eight. We know how the story goes. Cain wasn't too happy that God didn't accept his offering, but he accepted Abel, Abel's offering. And so Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, intense, don't you? <laughs> 
That's kind of overkill, don't you think? You could have just been mad at the guy, but he rose up and he slew him. Like, I don't know what his training was like. I don't know, uh, you know, this had obviously never been done before, but we have a responsibility, right, to teach our kids and to lead them in the right direction and show them how to behave with other people, how to interact with other people. We need to show them that, uh, you know, it's not okay to hurt others whenever you're mad at them. Isn't that what we start teaching them from a young age? As soon as they're little, man, they, as, soon as, as soon as they can, as soon as they understand, hey, that kid took something that I want from me, and I'm going to slap him or something like that, or I'm going to bite him with my teeth, and, and they can bite hard. All they got to have is a couple teeth, right? And they're going to bite hard. And so they get mad, and they do that kind of stuff, and, the, and somebody needs to be around to teach them, no, 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 you don't behave that way. You don't act like that. Hey, you need to learn how to share. You need to learn how to, you know, uh, I know you're mad at him, but you're going to have to learn how to get over it, you know? A child needs to know uh, uh, not to hurt others when they're mad at them. A child needs to know not to throw a fit when they don't get the attention that they want. Isn't that what what Cain is doing, basically? God didn't show me favor. He showed my brother favor. And he just got mad at him. So much so that he killed him, right? That's pretty pretty sincere. But look, we can do that maybe in a little way. You know, not know how to deal with people and just to get mad at them. And, And look, you look at society that wasn't raised with a father and a mother, wasn't raised in a godly home or whatever. And don't they do that, man? If they don't get what they want, they just throw a fit or they just steal from somebody else or, or whatever. Somebody needs to teach them these things. And so these are the types of things we see right here, right away in the Bible with the first uh, children. It's not okay to hate your brother because you're naturally jealous of him or you have a, a competitive spirit. Somehow children need to learn that it's not okay uh, or else guess what they're going to do they're just going to grow up to be a Cain type of a person they need to they need to learn these things are not okay so so the first question that I wanted to ask was uh, you know what does a child exactly need to learn but the second one is a little bit trickier who whose responsibility is it to teach them these things whose responsibility now of course our first answer is, and, it, and it's, I think it's true, is parents, okay? Uh, uh, that is true. Uh, we, uh, parents obviously have the first primary responsibility, but let me think of this. Let's look at our, look at our text again. And look at verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain uh, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstling of the flocks and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now, I'm not saying his parents weren't around for this. I kind of, I tend to believe that his parents were behind the scenes showing them what was right and what's wrong. But do you see his parents listed anywhere in this chapter? No. Look at verse 4. And Abel also brought of his firstling of his flocks and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain, his offering, he had not respect. Okay? Parents weren't responsible there, like saying, hey, good, good job, Cain. You know, that was a good, I don't see them there, right? Look at verse uh, 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? Now, I'm not saying his parents didn't ask him the same question, but who's asking him the question here? The Lord is asking him the question. All right? look at verse uh, 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Like, I I don't know where his parents are in this situation, but here's one thing I know. Everyone has their own individual accountability with God. I don't care how young they are. They are accountable before God. They've got to learn to answer God. You say, well, they hadn't been taught there's a God yet. Yeah, the Bible says everybody knows there's a God. Everybody has a conscience. Everybody has this ability to know right and wrong to some degree and to seek God. And from a young child, they are going to be responsible for what they do. It's not the parent's fault if they don't turn out right. It's not the, I mean, obviously they could bear some of the blame and the responsibility. It's going to be a whole lot easier for a child if the parents are helping them, right? But ultimately, who does it depend on? It depends on that child to decide, I'm going to do right or I'm going to do wrong. What about a child that's never heard the gospel? What about a child that's neglected by his parents? 
What about a child that has bad influences in their life? Or what, how about this? What about a child that was raised a Muslim? What about a child that was raised, you know, you name it, the false religion out there or, or some terrorist group or I don't know, the worst kind of people you can think about, whatever. Was it their fault they were raised like that? I remember we were knocking on the door uh, in Iola, right there around the church. She moved now, but uh, we were knocking on the door, and this lady came out. And she was really receptive. She listened really well. She didn't get saved, but she was saying, actually, she said, I was raised in a Wiccan home. You know what Wic Wicca is? Kind of like witch, witches, okay? And my mom was really heavy into Wicca, she said. And she said, actually, it's kind of funny because you think about, like, the stereotypical, like, the Christian home, and then the kid rebels, and maybe the kid will go into Wicca or something like that because they're kind of rebelling from their mom and dad. She said it was kind of the opposite for me. My mom was so into Wicca, and she raised me into Wicca, and her favorite, ho her favorite holiday was Halloween and all this kind of stuff. And she said, but I wanted to kind of sneak off and go to church with my friends, <laughs> you know, because I didn't want to go to that. Now, obviously, that Wiccan belief rubbed off on her. And she still had some, uh, some thoughts that were messed up and, and, and influenced by, by her mom. But she knew that in her heart, her decision to follow God was her own choice to make. And she said, I want to seek God, but I don't want my mom to know about it. <laughs> right? Look, nobody is going to get to heaven, stand before God, and say, hey, I, like, it wasn't my fault, God. I didn't know about you because nobody told me. That's not an excuse, the Bible says, Romans 1, right? I didn't know. Look, it's not my fault, God. If you only knew how bad my Christian parents treated me, right, you would understand why I rejected Christianity. That's not an excuse, right? You don't understand, God. It's just this happened, that happened. No, we're without excuse, the Bible says. Every man, oh, praise the Lord if you have good parents that keep you in church. Praise the Lord if you have good parents. Uh, that, that taught you the Bible and taught you all these kinds of things, but ultimately, not their responsibility, right? It's between you and the Lord. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? So apparently there was this proverb that they were using on a regular basis that was basically saying, Hey, you know, we're getting the punishment of God because of what our parents did. They're saying, you know, they ate the sour grapes. Our teeth are set on edge. They're basically blaming their, their parents for their mistakes. And he says, As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither, this is a list of things he was dealing with at that time with the children of Israel, hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath resorted to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, he that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just, he shall surely live, saith the Lord God. If he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like of any one of these things, and that doeth not any of those duties, but even, uh, even hath eaten upon the mountains uh, and defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and the needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, hath not lifted. This goes through the same things, right? Uh, explaining what uh, he just said. Verse 14, Now, lo, if he beget a son 
Uh, I'm sorry, I, I should have just kept reading. Verse 13. Hath given forth upon usury and hath taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations, he shall surely die, his blood shall be upon him. Now look, I'm not talking about salvation and saying that salvation is by works or anything like that, but here's what I'm saying. God is going to judge you based on your actions and your behavior, and it doesn't matter what your parents did. It doesn't matter what you were taught. It doesn't matter if you had a Sunday school teacher or you didn't have a Sunday school teacher or somebody who was a pastor that was faithful to preach the Bible or wasn't. Uh, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, you're the one that's going to be held responsible. You might think that that doesn't seem fair to you, but it doesn't matter. This is what the Bible says. Amen. I would say there's only one exception to this, and that would be the accountability of children who are too young to know right and wrong. Okay, obviously that demographic exists. A child doesn't know what's right and what's wrong. Just so young, so innocent that they are not held accountable for those, those, uh, those things that they did. I mean, because quite honestly, a child, uh, I mean, they could be so young and, and be lying, saying they're crying that they're hungry when they're not really hungry. Or, I mean, they could be doing these things, but look, they don't know right and wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, uh, uh, so I do believe, obviously, in the age of accountability, whatever that age is, different, different for each individual, I'm sure. Only God knows. Okay, but naturally, now I've said all this. Now, listen, naturally, God gives parents the responsibility to raise kids. Am I right? I mean, uh, they can't get over that in the Bible. And I'll say this. Even if a parent improperly trains their children, maybe they're overly aggressive on their discipline, or maybe, you know, they don't really show them a good example in their life or whatever, but they're just there and they're just trying to raise their kid, they're disciplining their kid to some way or another, uh, look, that is still, you know, the job of a parent. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 for an example of this. Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 9. Hebrews 12, 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, parents ought to chasten, discipline their children for the right reasons. Right? They want them to do right. They want them to be honoring and pleasing to God. That should be why they discipline. But let's be honest. Sometimes a parent just disciplines a child, right? Because, hey, I want this child to behave in public and not make me look bad. Or, hey, you're annoying me, you know, <laughs> and they'll spank them or yell at or something like that. Whether they're right or wrong, that's not the point, but here's what I'm saying. That child, it says for a short time, for however long they're living in that house, they've got somebody over them who's their authority, somebody giving them some discipline and some correction and all that kind of stuff. Look, even bad parents out there, right? But they're actually being parents, even if they're messing up, right? They're still doing good for their kids. That is way better than somebody who doesn't have parents. Around, right. Okay? So even though we can't blame our parents necessarily for our choices in the future, it obviously is going to be so much helpful, and it's right for a parent, for a child to have a parent. And look, this is my opinion. There's a limitation to this, I know, but this is my opinion on like. Uh, DHS or maybe SRS, I think at one point it was called, but the government agencies that will kind of uh, uh, oversee a person's household and take kids out of the home from that parent because maybe they, you know, whatever the case, I mean, I've seen a case where a guy supposedly the only thing wrong, I don't know this for sure, but supposedly the only thing wrong is they came in to check him out and he had a knife on his counter that was open, like a, like a knife Switchblade or not, not a switchblade, but just a knife that you keep in your It was open, and they said that's unsafe, and they took the child out. Now, there's probably more going on. There may have been evidence of drugs or something like that, you know. And I say, yes, that's a bad thing. That's a bad parent thing to do to have drugs in your house whenever kids are around or whatever. But look, you don't know what happened, what's going to happen to that child. When you think what is good for them is that you take them away from that child, right? I've been on a, I was in the bus ministry for many years and I had a heart for these children, man, when you see what some of their lives are like at home, I mean, you probably witness it uh, as well. 
Uh, but you see what, uh, some of the things that happen. And, and sometimes you would see something and think, man, I think there might be a little bit of abuse going on at home. You know, I don't know what to do exactly. But, you know, this kid maybe is being punished a little too severely or something like that. You know, I had one kid, uh, he'd come to me crying all the time and say, my dad spanks me. He, he beats me. He's, a, he's from Africa. His dad was from Africa. And he said, he beats me. He beats me. He beats me. But this kid was in so much trouble. I mean, he was always stealing, always fighting. He was doing all these kinds of stuff. And I would talk to his dad, and his dad would say, I'm doing everything I could to get this kid to behave. I beat him. I've done all this kind of stuff. But you know what happened? He'd go to the public school, like the principal or the teacher or something like that, and say, my dad beats me, my dad beats me. And then his, the police would come to his dad's house and say, hey, you are not allowed to touch your son anymore, or else we're going to take him away from you. And so his dad's telling me, hey, I don't know what to do. And his son's telling me, my dad beats me, my dad beats me. And I said, if you're, if you're so afraid of your dad beating you, why do you keep getting in trouble? <laughs> I don't understand. If you don't steal stuff, if you don't fight, if you don't give him a hard time, he's not going to beat you. That's probably not the wisdom that the world wants to hear, but I'm just saying, look, he's at least in a home that had a dad who, who had some concern for him. And so I don't think it's right for somebody to just get involved and be like, hey, let's just take that child out of the home. Like I said, I've seen too many cases where they get put into a foster care and the foster care is worse than it was. Yeah. You know, I think that that's something that the government shouldn't be involved in. Right. So obviously a parent has a huge responsibility uh, in the child. Let me just say this. The church... Throughout the ages, you know, it's probably about the 1800s before Sunday school ever started. I don't know if you know the history behind Sunday school, but actually somebody uh, had this great idea and they were evangelizing and they, and they saw all these kids that were homeless during the, in the 1800s and they, they didn't have parents around. Maybe they had died or maybe they had kind of given up their kids because they didn't have money or whatever the case was. And they saw all these orphan kids. And they said, hey, we need to start this. And they, it was called Sunday school. And every Sunday they would go, they would teach them how to read and to write and some of these basic things as an evangelistic opportunity and show them the Bible and, and try. And it wasn't long before the Sunday school movement blew up. And it was like just, you know, huge, large Sunday school classes, you know. And then that kind of transformed over to kind of like, if you ever look at the Jack Hiles manual, like he's basically just or somebody over that age and they, you know, that's just kind of how he did it. Most churches kind of picked that up and went with it. But that's the history of the Sunday school uh, program. And throughout, throughout history, I think churches have had a desire to see kids do right, to see kids grow. I mean, we see that all throughout the Bible as well. But here's the thing that's lacking in so many of these cases. And I know, that, again, I've been in children's ministries for most of my my Christian life, okay, some to some degree or another. And here's what's lacking. It's, yes, we are getting children to come into the church, but the parents are just gone. Right. The parents aren't there. And it actually becomes babysitting. I've heard of stories where they come and they drop the kids off, and everyone thinks that the parents, or even the nursery, I've heard where they, they drop their kids off into the nursery, infants, okay, into the nursery, and then they just disappeared. <laughs> they went to the movie theater or something like that and had a good old time, had a date, and they came back a little bit late, and the nursery workers were still staying there with the baby. And all they wanted was free babysitting, you know, free daycare. And our society has been conditioned for that, and now, hey, just drop your kids off at the public school. Let somebody else teach them. And I've seen little bitty kids, you know, maybe six years old, and the mommy just drops them up off at the curb, right? See you, have a good day, and then they pull off and go to work, and that child's got to make it from that car to that door. We don't know what happens to that child. Right. You know, you don't know what happens to that child when they get inside the door. And by the way, you don't know what happens to a child when they get inside the door of a church. Yeah, right. I, I, there was a time where I never would have believed that could happen. Never could I have believed that a child, somebody would go pick up a child for a Sunday school class or for vacation Bible school or something like that and then would abuse that child in one way or another. I never would have thought that would happen in a million years. And then I began to see reports in churches that I was a part of. Now, I'm not blaming the church necessarily and saying that it was a wicked church. I'm just saying there are reprobates out there right. that will mess up kids. And they get in there, you know, and they work their ways into churches, especially churches with big children's programs and stuff like that. 
and they do stuff that, uh, in broad daylight, you know, just, just that you wouldn't even want to think about. And so obviously over the years, my philosophy on children's ministries has changed a little bit. Number one, I believe it's the parent's responsibility responsibility. I already said that even if the parent is a bad parent, the child is still going to have to be accountable before God. But number one in their life is their parent. Their parent has to be around. Parents, preferably, right? And so if this is more kind of introduction as to uh, ministering to children. Number one, the best way I think that we can help children get their parents saved. Right. Show their parents what the Bible says. Right. Show their parents how to raise their children because they don't know. The public school doesn't teach right. parents how to raise their children. Right? All these senders that are coming in and taking it. Now they say, oh, we're trying to restore families. We're trying to help them. They put so many restrictions on them, so many things they can't do. They can't raise their kids according to the Bible. Right. Right? You can't trust the secular world who's not even allowed to talk about God or whatever on their job right. to raise children right. right. Okay. So our job, the best thing we can do to minister to children is to reach their parents. Mm -hmm. Reach right. them when they're young, before they even have children. <laughs> you know, Amen. Teach them the Bible. Teach them how to raise their children. And then look, <clears throat> their job is to look, talk to their children at home. Deuteronomy talks about that, right? Posting the, I, I wish I had it memorized. Uh, posting the Bible on the walls where they can read the, read the Word of God, right? And teach them as they sit down. Right, and you and you rise up, and all these, and they're teaching their kids. That's the best way. That's we we know statistics. The world knows the statistics of a parent that actually cares for their kid. The kid's going to go a lot farther. Now we know as Christians that a godly parent is going to just help that child to go so much farther. Okay. All right. It should not be. None of these statistics should be found anywhere in the in in the church, yeah. where children are. What was some of these things that they were doing? Committing suicide. Like I've heard of churches where kids are people kids are committing suicide, and I'm not going to just like just lump everything together. But you know what I would suspect? These kids probably didn't have their parents around. So, but they're in church. You know, I, I don't know, but I think in a church where mom and dad are around and they care for the kid and they love them, trying their best to discipline them and take care of them and raise them up, probably not going to have that kid grow up and commit suicide. I'm just saying that's my guess. Probably not going to run away from home. They're probably not going to have the behavioral disorders that are going to cause them to uh, be put on all kinds of drugs and all that kind of stuff. They're probably not going to drop out of school. They're probably not going to go to uh, juvenile detention or experiment with uh, uh, substances. Like I know sometimes this stuff happens, but for the most part, if the mom and the dad are around and they actually care for the kids, they're trying to do something, the kid's going to be spared from all these things. So the best thing we can do is teach parents and, and, and adults what the Bible says, and let them learn from God, and then let them teach their kids to learn from God, because ultimately their relationship with God is the one that's most important. I find it so interesting that God is directly talking to Cain and directly talking to Abel, right? They're accountable to him. I mean, they, they, there's no excuse for blaming on, on what the how the system messed you up, right? You were just you 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 couldn't help it because you were raised into a a poor family, so you didn't ever get a chance in this life. How many times you heard that excuse used, right? There's no excuse, right? We all have the same God, the same conscience, the same ability to understand God. But the church does have some ways that I think, quite honestly, uh, we've dropped the ball. Now, I'm not going to get into it this time. This will be the next lesson. But just, just to kind of whet your appetite towards the next lesson, Here's something I think that we failed at. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, uh, for a long time, really. But when my philosophy changed and I said, you know, I think we need to focus more on the integrated family type of an idea, and not just getting a bunch of kids and putting them in the Sunday school. And I saw problems with that from the very beginning, uh, but that's all I do. All right. And now my philosophy changed a little bit more about that. Hey, parents are responsible for their own kids, and they got to sit there at church and, and, a, and a church congregation. I mean, you look through the Bible, look at Nehemiah and all that, and the whole congregation was there old men, young men, women, children. They were all there in one congregation listening to the preaching, right? And a child can learn a lot from sitting through preaching with, with the adults, right. okay? But here's what I fear that has happened is, is to some degree, a lot of ministries have just overlooked. The children 
and the children just show up to church every day and they're obeying their parents and they're listening. Look, that's good. That's good. That's a step above, I think, any other model that we see out there, right? But I feel like, man, something, something is, there are some creative ways that it ministers, I'm not talking about just pastors, but ministries geared towards children can be a huge asset in getting the word of God into the children, right. primarily though through the families, right? And that the, and kind of giving the parents tools to equip them with so that they can help the children. And praise the Lord, I've seen different things recently, uh, not to embarrass anybody or anything like that, but I know that Mrs. Stevie started doing this newsletter uh, where there's little activities kids can do and stuff like that. How many of you guys have, haven't seen that yet? We need to make sure everybody gets to see that. Um, but uh, it's just a simple newsletter with some little children's drawings and some children's stories. And actually, there's some other churches that got involved. Uh, uh, what, what church is it that does the crossword? All Scripture. All Scripture Baptist Church. They contribute to that and do some uh, crossword puzzles and that part of whatever, word find or something like that. <laughs> And, uh, and, and and that was cool. I saw that. I think, man, that's a good idea. And, of course, it would come from a family, right? So they're thinking, hey, we need to get things to do with kids. And uh, and I saw that, and I thought, man, that's a great idea. And then uh, primarily, I think, man, I've seen so many good things come out of this COVID-19 whole thing. Let me just, I'm, I'm going to try not to spend too much time. In it. But through this time, I, I saw that people stepped up and started doing, like, children's ministry thing. Have you seen that? Verity Baptist Church, I know, started doing this puppet Puppet show. They do a great job, and uh, and it's like something that kids can watch, and it's good doctrinal type things. He even wrote a book, right? And uh, and I've seen other people try to do the same thing during this time. They're like, hey, well, we're all home with our kids more than usual, and so they begin to you know come up with these creative ideas of things that they can do to help kids. I think it's a great idea. I think we need to help uh, parents to be able to raise these kids, maybe speak on their level a little bit more, right, and help them to gradually get to the place where they can. Uh, I'll be doing these types of things. But man, let, let me just close by saying this because I brought up the, the COVID-19 thing. I always want to encourage you. It has nothing to do with the message here, but man, I just, some of you probably saw, uh, you know, I, mean, I put something about this on Facebook, but I just got to think, man, I was going for a run the other day and all of a sudden it just hit me. And I was like, man, this is a terrible time in our society. And I, I saw all these people are like, man, I just want to wake up and 2020 is gone, you know, <laughs> or let's restart 2020 and all these kind of funny memes and stuff about how 2020 has been so bad. And this COVID-19 uh, thing has messed everybody up and all that. And in my mind, I just started thinking, what's it done for our church? And I thought about this, you know, the first thing that I noticed right off the bat that was a blessing is the Lord provided and opened up this building for us Amen. to meet in at a strategic time, right? right. We didn't know what was going to happen. And all of a sudden, Matt Ross Community Center shuts down. There's no place to meet. Oh, but we got this place. Amen. It didn't slow us down one beat. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, God wants us to meet. Man, he's behind what we're doing, and he's happy. That's exciting, right? And then, uh, you know, and in the beginning of the year, I said, okay, 2020, I did what so many pastors did and said, hey, we got a Acts 2020 vision, right? We're going to preach publicly and from house to house. And so I thought about that. I said, well, we're already meeting regularly. Obviously, we're not going to. We want to keep on that up, try to get people in here and, 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 and you know, uh, see the church grow in that way. But not only that, we want to continue so maybe even to a greater degree, right? We don't want to stop, slow down that for one minute. And that's it. But, uh, but beyond that, I think maybe we need to work on having more of a presence out there, you know, a public preaching today. I think the Internet is a huge part of that, right? How can more people see uh, the ministry, the work of the ministry and hear the Bible preached and hear the gospel being preached? In a more public setting, right? Not so private. I mean, our church services and private affairs or whatever are handled this way, but then there's also a public aspect of that. Well, through the situation right here, the stay at home and all those staying at home, we decided, hey, we got to get up that uh, uh, that live stream service. And I'm not saying it's like made this huge, you know, everybody's watching live stream, but what it did is allow us to, to step it up a little bit. And the soul winning, man, has just been like, just tremendous the reception and the amount of people that we've seen saved. And I'm just like, praise the Lord. And I hope other people can realize what I feel in my heart about how God has just blessed us during this time and said, look, you keep doing the work. I'll keep providing, you know, you keep doing the work. I'll keep you safe. You keep doing the work. I'm going to bless the effort, right? Why? Because we're wanting to glorify him. Why wouldn't he allow us and give us what we want so that he can, he can get blessed. 
But anyway, that didn't have anything to do with the children, but uh, I just wanted to mention uh, a blessing there. And I think one of the things that I have been inspired to do, we'll be able to do this somehow, is to be thinking about children you know, in a greater way. Not to take away the parents' responsibility and to be like, hey, I'm going to show you how to raise your children. You know, let me teach them, you know, in a, in a closed door, behind closed doors somewhere where you don't know what, uh, what's being taught or said. No, but there are certain, certain tools that we can provide and ways that we can help the children to be able to grow. And I think that's just another thing that the Lord has, has given us during this time.